welcome. We are delighted to be here with all of you tonight. I um, want to say uh, a few words of introduction about uh, the program and our speaker, uh, and then just a few logistics in terms of how the evening is going to go um, and chat. I'm told that I'm people are having trouble hearing me. Uh, would you wave your hand if you can hear me? Okay, so most people are able to hear. So I'm not sure whoever just uh, just chatted me on that. I'm, it may be something on your on your end. I'm sorry, uh, but if you if you can't, uh, please you know put that in the in the chat, and I will try to uh, do what I can to uh, deal with any uh, technical. Uh, difficulties as they come up. Um, we have a lot of people on the call tonight. We have 120 people here right now and more participants are coming in as uh, as we speak. Uh, so everyone's going to remain muted during the program. Um, if you have a question, I'm going to invite you to put that in the chat box um, and I'll be uh, kind of moderating and curating the, the questions after uh, we hear the presentation from Dr. Schwartz, um, and, uh, but you can put in your, your question really at any time during the program. Uh, so that sort of takes care of the, the housekeeping side of things. Um, and I just want to say on, on behalf of, uh, of BJ and the Race and Us Steering Committee, uh, how, how grateful we are uh, to Dr. Schwartz for taking the time um, to be with us and, and present to us, uh, as you will hear, uh, Dr. Schwartz has both a lot of personal uh, research uh, scholarship in, in this area and also uh, personal uh, professional experience as an educator as uh, the associate principal of general studies at the SAR high school in uh, the Bronx in Riverdale. Uh, so has worked in Jewish day schools and the topic that she'll be speaking about is um, is one that she kind of lives and this has been a particularly busy time for uh, for school for educators and administrators. So again, we're, we're so glad that you're here and thank you. Um, tonight uh, is the I think fourth or fifth uh, public lecture program in the Race and Us um, initiative in the series that we have organized this year at BJ. Uh, we began um, with another uh, uh, scholar from the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America, Dr. Yehuda Kurtzer, um, and really kicked it off in a conversation with him and, and Yavila McCoy about the uh, role of race and narrative and the stories we tell as Jews and as a collective Jewish community about who we are, who is in in the Jewish community, what our community looks like, what our values have been, what our choices have been as Americans and as American Jews. Um, and sometimes the stories that we tell um, are don't always meet the the reality of what uh, of what actually has happened. And there are complications in the narratives that uh, can be easy to overlook because we want to tell a certain story about who we are, who we've been, and who we're going to be. Uh, and so our, all of our lectures and programs have been trying to uh, complicate those stories and get uh, bring in uh, experts and scholars uh, and also through interactive pieces, uh, ways for people to engage and critically look at our history, our present reality, um, and that may make us a little bit uncomfortable sometimes, but uh, that's where we grow and, uh, and we see the path towards greater growth. Um, so we very much hope that tonight's presentation uh, will be a, a critical component of that for those of us who, like myself, who went to day school, uh, who have children who go to Jewish day school, uh, the questions about privilege and uh, how we're exercising privilege in that educational sphere uh, when so there's so clearly um, tremendous needs and brokenness in the larger educational system in many areas of this country. Uh, these are 
live questions for many of us. Um, and perhaps even if our children are not in day school, but are in a private school, uh, all of these questions about privilege and where we live and how that connects to how we educate our children and what we do when values come into conflict with one another or there are tensions in our values um, are, are very much alive for many of us. Uh, so with that, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Rivka Press Schwartz, who, as I mentioned, is uh, an administrator and teacher at the SAR High School in Riverdale and also a research fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America and has spent more than 15 years uh, in the field of Jewish secondary and post-secondary education. Uh, and her uh, research has been on the culture, or her doctoral research was on the cultural history of the Manhattan Project. And, uh, and now she lectures widely on issues of contemporary importance, particularly in the Orthodox community, but in the Jewish community uh, writ large. So Rivka, welcome. We are thrilled to have you here. Thank you so much, Rabbi Paso. Um, yeah, the, the amount of time that I spent um, choosing my dissertation topic is only exceeded by the utter irrelevance of it to my life right now. So um, that's a life lesson for us, I suppose. Um, it's fascinating for me to hear that this whole sequence of sessions has been framed around the issue of narrative and of stories, because that's very much how I think of my own work. Or maybe that's a natural convergence when we're talking about this topic. Race is such a fraught, loaded, complicated topic in American life. I don't have to tell you that. And it acquires multiple other layers of fraughtness and complicatedness when we embark on Jewish life. I wanna mention two of those layers, if only to acknowledge that one of them I'm really not going to be talking about tonight. One of those layers of complication is the reality that you know, the Ashkenormativity and the, and the assumed whiteness of Jews and the reality of many and more all the time Jews of color and the extent to which our community um, is a warm, welcoming place for all of its members, or it sort of defines some of its members as the norm and some of its members as the not really. That's a really big challenge that our community is facing today. It's not one that I'm going to address at all, largely because I'm talking about the 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s right now. And that's a time when our, our American Jewish community actually was much whiter than it is now. A different challenge for us, though, is the extent to which to talk about Jews as white is to talk about Jews as having power in certain ways. And we are, we are uncomfortable with that discussion for a few reasons. The first, I say to you the week of Yom HaShoah, is that any conversation of Jewish power to many of us rings hollow. Um, and I say that in the world that we are living in, not right now, not the world of COVID-19, but the world that we were living in right up until COVID-19, was a world in which some of us wondered if we spent a little bit too much time talking about Jewish power and not enough time talking about anti-Semitism. Um, and so navigating that complication of what does it mean to talk about race and Jews and what's Jews place in America, specifically American Jews, and Jews place in America's racial hierarchy is something that we're going to eventually come to tonight because if we're talking about Jews and race, we have to face that question squarely. But if we're talking about stories and we're talking about narratives, I want to start by telling you a story, not a story about the topic of my research yet, but about a conversation that I had. Um, around the 2016 election, I, like many people, got interested in the question of citizenship in American life, how we teach Americans to be citizens or we don't, how good Americans are at being citizens or aren't, um, and with particular interest in the Jewish community and the Orthodox Jewish community. How do we engage as American citizens? And in the course of that, I started to look for other religious subgroups as models for how religious groups might engage with the broader American project. Um, and I found my way to a book by the Reverend Russell Moore. Russell Moore is the head of the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention. So he's a Southern Baptist minister, but he's the head of kind of like the think tank arm of the Southern Baptist movement. Southern Baptist uh, religious denomination is generally thought of as being a more charismatic and less cerebral one, but he heads their think tank arm. And he wrote a book in 2015 called Onward, How to Engage the Culture Without Losing the Gospel. Now, obviously, losing the gospel is not my concern one way or the other, but the question of how religious people can and should engage with the broader culture was very much of interest to me. So I read Reverend Moore's book, and then um, I have a life lesson that I learned from my mother. My mother taught me that the worst thing they can do is say no. 
So I went to Reverend Moore's website and I sent him an email. I said, I'm an Orthodox Jewish educator, researcher, working on citizenship in my community, interested in talking to you about your community. Can we set up a time to talk? I got an email back from the vice president of the Ethics and Religious Liberty uh, Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention, a man named Travis Wusso. And he said, Reverend Moore, he's, he's really busy, he's doing a lot of stuff, but we can talk. So I sent him an email back saying, yeah, no thanks. I really wanted to talk to Dr. Moore. Not so interested in talking to you. And he sent me another email back saying, no, no, really, I think it would be productive for us to talk, at which point I realized he wanted to talk to me too. We had a fascinating conversation about the similarities and differences and, and the ways we think about and look at our religious communities. He knew much more about my religious community than I knew about his. He had spent two years living and teaching in Jerusalem. Um, but one thing he said really stuck with me, because I was talking about all the hand-wringing we do as an American Jewish community and an American Orthodox Jewish community about questions of continuity and passing on our values to our kids and what will the next generation look like and let's count up all the many ways we're failing, right? We love to do that. We do that stuff all the time. I want to ask how many, you know, how many synagogue lecture series have been launched by the Pew study and all the endless, endless concerns about those kinds of things. And he said to me, really? Because from where we sit, we think you guys have got it all figured out. You're like the ultimate success story. You've solved for everything. I said, oh, do tell. I'd love to know how we've solved for everything. And his answer was, because you get your families to pay for religious education. He said, if we could get our families to pay for religious education, imagine what we could accomplish. Imagine what we could do. Imagine how we could shape the way our kids think about their religion and their lives. But in his community, when people opt out of the public school system, what they tend to do is homeschool. And while that might be great, given that many of us are doing some version of that right now. We certainly see the challenges, like we are not all experts in all the things we are supposed to be homeschooling our children in. And so he felt that if young Southern Baptist children were being taught religion, not by their parents, wonderful as that is, but by people um, with more experience, expertise, skill, and pedagogy, they might shape their community in a different way. Travis Wusso's narrative about the American modern Orthodox community very much reinforces a core Jewish community narrative about the Jewish community. That's our story. That's the story we like to tell about ourselves. We value education so much that we are willing to pay for it in one way or another to pass our values on, right? It might be um, in a day school education, it might be in a Sunday school, it might be in a Talmud Torah, it might be in supplementary school, it might be in a lot of different contexts, but we are investing in our kids' education. And more broadly, we as a community highly value education, not only their religious education, we are investing in our kids' education in other ways, caring about the kind of schooling they get, caring about their colleges. That is how we as, our, as a community have um, made it both religiously and secularly in American life and how we pass that on to our kids. That's the story we tell ourselves about us and education. And I'm not quite sure how I got to sort of poking around at that story and trying to figure out, I don't know what made me wonder if that story was really the right story, the whole story, enough of the story. I want to say that if you did not in fact send your kids to day school, and so you think that what I'm talking about is of no relevance to you, I promise, uh, that as Shuli said, that as we go on, we are going to bring in um, a few other things that I hope will make uh, equal opportunity discomfort, not only discomfort for those of us who are day school parents, that will probably make day school parents the most uncomfortable. But we're going to try to make everybody um, at least feel challenged. I tell my students when I teach them, the goal of learning American history is not to make you feel warm and fuzzy in your tummy. And if you're learning American history in an honest way, it's probably not going to make you feel warm and fuzzy in your tummy going to make you feel challenged in certain important ways. Um, so we're going to try to pose some of those challenges and then think about what we do with those challenges. Because the goal is not just to leave us feeling like, oh, we're awful and everything stinks. It's to think meaningfully about what we do with those challenges um, that we've been posed with. So the sources were sent out to you in advance. I hope you had the chance to look at them. When we had originally conceived this evening, obviously long before we found ourselves in our uh, respective Zoom rooms, we thought we'd be together and doing some reading in pairs and then um, talking together. For this format, I think this works better. Uh, if you haven't had the chance to read, I will at various points along the way highlight individual pieces of this that I think are uh, worth our looking at altogether. But if you want to spend more time with the sources, you have them to refer back to. And obviously, you can always go back um, to the books that they draw from. 
Actually, as I think about it, I might know how I ended up talking about school. So there's an historian at Princeton University named Kevin Cruz, and Kevin Cruz wrote a book called One Nation Under God about religion, the role of Christian religion in American uh, civic and business life. And I got Kevin Cruz's book because I thought that was going to be the book that was going to start to talk about some of these questions that I wanted. And I'm not quite sure how I came to realize there was actually a different book of Kevin Cruz's that we needed to read. And that book was, this is again, Professor Kevin Cruz of Princeton University and his book about white flight. He focuses specifically on the city of Atlanta. And Kevin Cruz is writing about how after 1954, the United States Supreme Court and Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, orders schools to desegregate so you can no longer have explicitly black and white public schools in Atlanta. So officially, Atlanta billed itself as the city too busy to hate. It was a modern metropolis. It was a hub of business. This was not like some southern backwater where all kinds of unpleasant racist stuff was going on. But in fact, the parents in the city too busy to hate did not want to send, the white parents in the city too busy to hate, did not want to send their children to school with African-American children. And so they established private schools that were white only, that in a, um, one must say, a creditable bit of truth in marketing, they called segregation academies. So that's what they were. Again, Brown versus Board of Education said you couldn't segregate public schools. You could still segregate private schools. They established private or white schools called segregation academies. And here's what I read in Kevin Cruz that hit me like a ball peen hammer between the eyes. Look at the highlighted paragraph. The success of segregation academies, however, rested on their affordability. Many whites wanted segregated education for their children, but few could pay for it on their own. Therefore, supporters of segregation academies tried to tap into state funds to help parents of all classes send their children there. Initially, they hoped to use new legislation that allowed Georgians to give money to private schools instead of paying their state income tax. Similar tax credits had been installed by segregationists in Virginia as a way of channeling public tax money to private segregated schools, and Georgia hoped to follow their example. Okay, I think everybody's muted, so I can't ask you a question, but I'm going to ask anyway. Raise your hand if anything about this sounds remotely familiar, like something you've heard about in our political discourse today, like vouchers to send people to private schools. These systems, these schemes, by the way, in which you can donate to a private school and have it count against your taxes, these exist in a number of states today. That same system, that same system for allowing people to divert tax money into private schools, exist in some states for funding private schools today. And in many cases, including in New York State, Jewish day schools have pushed for measures like this, for state funding to private religious schools and even for tax dollars to be diverted to private schools. And that got me thinking, because if the funding mechanism was the same, maybe the raison d'etre bore more of a similarity than we wanted to think as well. Here we have segregation academies that existed to create an all-white space for students in an Atlanta where the schools were integrating, and people were trying to come up with clever ways of getting government funding to support these schools, and that sounded way too similar to what, um, to what I knew from my own life. Um, but it actually, uh, it actually goes farther than that because the segregation academies were not long for the world. They were a little bit too gross, a little bit too overt, a little bit too obvious. And so the segregation academies closed. What were left were either Christian schools, which somehow sort of ended up being all white or almost all white without officially being all white. And then something else started to happen. People moved out of the city, white people, moved out of the city of Atlanta proper into suburbs where in much smaller suburban communities, they advocated for local control of their own local schools, which just so happened to be all white. And so instead of having separate segregation academies, you ended up with community schools in these suburbs growing up that were all white. 
Now, for a long time, I thought, for a long time, I taught my US history students that those suburbs were all white because of some combination of African Americans not having the means to live there, people sort of sorting the way they wanted to sort, I don't know, people choosing to live together, affinity. I'm not really actually sure precisely what I told my students. In retrospect, it seems horrifically naive. In 2017, a really, really important new book came out, and I was reading it over Sukkot of that year, and I already used Bull Peen Hammer between the eyes, so I'm not sure what to call this one now, but whatever it was, it was like that. It was another moment of, I can't believe that I didn't know this story. I'm not pulling rank here, but I have a doctorate in a subfield connected to American history from you know, a fairly good university. How did I manage not to know this stuff? That book is Richard Rothstein, The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America. So he puts that word, for, word forgotten in there to make people like me feel better. You're not a total idiot for not knowing this. Other people managed to forget this history too. But I learned, I want to, I want to quote now, um, a psychologist from Toronto named Gila ben Shemol, who works on um, questions of sexual abuse and how communities respond to sexual abuse. And from her, I learned something incredibly important, which is that silence is not passive, it is active. Silence doesn't just happen. We build silence, we construct silence, we make and enforce silence. So when I say a story was forgotten, I don't mean, oh, somehow it managed to fall off the pages of history. We chose not to know this uncomfortable part of our past. So here's an uncomfortable part of our past we chose not to know. We chose to tell ourselves that segregation in northern cities and northern suburbs just sort of happened because people sorted and whatever. Segregation in northern cities and northern suburbs was government policy. It was imposed by the government. It was mandated by the government every bit as much as Jim Crow in Alabama or Mississippi. That is true. That is factual. That is something we chose not to know. Again, I'm not going to read um, all of uh, what Rothstein writes here, but the way this worked was that in order for the government to guarantee mortgage loans, the government required that the uh, mortgage loans meet certain criteria of creditworthiness, and it divided all homes in the United States, all districts, all areas in which there were homes in the United States into four areas on the basis of the quality of the neighborhood and therefore the creditworthiness of the loan. And those classifications, A, B, C, D, was like, you know, green, blue, yellow, and red, red, they were really subtle there, um, related to the racial and ethnic composition of those communities, okay? So let's just read a little bit um, of, uh, of Rothstein, and then we'll get to one more bullpen hammer between the eyes. Today's residential segregation in the North, South, Midwest, and West is not the unintended consequence of individual choices and of otherwise well-meaning law or regulation, but of unhidden public policy that explicitly segregated every metropolitan area in the United States. The policy was so systematic and forceful that its effects endure to the present time. Without our government's purposeful imposition of racial segregation, the other causes, private prejudice, white flight, real estate steering, bank redline, income differences, and self-segregation still would have existed, but with far less opportunity for expression. So as I'm, I'm going to stop the share for a minute so I can talk to you again. I forgot that I left the share on, and we'll put it back on when I want to share again. As I'm reading Rothstein, and I'm being absolutely staggered by what he's saying, and I'm wondering how I managed not to know this before, even though I'm not an academic anymore. I know my academic training well enough to flip to the back and look at his sources. Where are his footnotes? Where is he getting this from? And one of his sources, again, is a, you know, a staggering on top of the staggering here, because he cites a book that not only do I own, but it's sitting on my bookshelf somewhere right behind me. The book is called Crabgrass Frontier by Kenneth Jackson. And it's one of the earliest histories of suburbanization in the United States. Kenneth Jackson was a major urban historian at Columbia University. Um, he also wrote histories of the city of New York, but this is a broader history of suburbanization. I read Crabgrass Frontier while I was in graduate school. I read that book. I didn't remember the things that Rothstein was referring to as being in that book. So I go and yank the book off the bookshelf. I look at the book, I go flip to the pages he's referring to, and there it is. <laughs> 
an explicit discussion of the ways in which the government imposed and enforced segregation of schools. So my choice to not know that, my choice to manage to forget that wasn't just I hadn't learned it, it was actually I somehow had learned it and managed to like right over my head. So here we go. Um, next source, Kenneth Jackson, Crabgrass Frontier, 1985, okay? The Homeowners Loan Corporation, again, that's a federal government agency um, dealing with loans. Four categories of quality, imaginatively titled first, second, third, and fourth with corresponding code letters of A, B, C, and D and colors of green, blue, yellow, and red were established. The first grade, also A in green areas, were described as new, homogenous, and in demand as residential locations. Homogenous meant American business and professional men. I leave it to your imagination to understand what American means here. You don't have to try so hard. Jewish neighborhoods, or even those with an infiltration of Jews, could not be considered best any more than they could be considered American. So uh, neighborhoods with large numbers of Jews could at best be graded B or blue. The third grade yellow or C neighborhoods were usually described as definitely declining, while the fourth grade red neighborhoods were defined as areas that have already um, declined. Okay. As was the case in every city, any Afro-American presence was a source of substantial concern to the HOLC. The officials evinced a keen interest in the movement of black families and included maps of the density of black settlement with every analysis. Not surprisingly, even those neighborhoods with small proportions of black inhabitants were usually rated fourth grade or hazardous. Again, this is not private people making private choices. This is the government of the United States saying what mortgages are worth the government backing and what aren't. The impact of this is enormous. The impact of the government's choices, um, the laws that are passed, the way that they are enforced, again, the color of law, not just the collective choices of real estate agents and home buyers and home sellers, has an enormous impact which ta Coates wrote about in the first piece that really brought him to substantial fame long before he wrote uh, Between the World and Me or Black Panther, um, which was a really long article in The Atlantic in 2014 called The Case for Reparations. And ta Coates there was making the case for reparations to African-American citizens. And he gave us one specific example, the way that African-Americans had been shut out of home ownership as the enormous engine of wealth creation that it was in the post-World War II American scene. And again, that's not just coincidence and it's not just individual choices. Enormous systemic and governmental choices locked African-Americans out of that engine of wealth creation with enormous impact moving forward. So let's just notice what we have on the table here and then I wanna throw one more thing on the table and then we're gonna to start to think about what it means. What we have on the table here is that people pulling their kids out of public schools and putting them into religious schools and then seeking governmental support for those religious schools. A story that we might have told ourselves in the Jewish community as a story of concern for transmission of our values. But in Atlanta, that was a story of trying to find a legal way to hold on to segregated schools. And if it was that in Atlanta, I have to look really uncomfortably about whether it was that in a lot of other places and a lot of other communities and a lot of Jewish communities as well. And whether the rise of day schools, Orthodox day schools, but also non-Orthodox Jewish day schools, conservative day schools, reform day schools, community schools, whether the rise of day schools starting in the 1960s and the 1970s is actually not just about, we wanna give our, our kids a Jewish education, but it's about something else as well. And to the extent to which the resegregating of schools is accomplished not by sending my kids to religious schools, but by sending my kids to the local private school in the suburb that I moved to from the city, and that suburb just happens to be white. So the community school in the suburb just happens to be white. Richard Rothstein, following Jackson and others, says it didn't just happen to be white. Those were laws that were passed to keep it white, to lock African Americans out of those suburbs which had the dual effect of maintaining segregated schools and also locking African-Americans, again, out of the enormous wealth that was created as those suburban homes rose in value. Okay, so you're gonna say to me, that, that's really tough, that's really rough. That's rough if you send your kid to an Orthodox day school, I feel bad for you, you gotta face the racist history of your schools. Uh, that's rough if you live in the suburbs, I feel bad for you, you gotta face the racist history of your suburbs. Luckily for me, I'm a non-Orthodox Jew living in New York City, I am good. Sorry, here comes Sarah Smith. Um, I met Sarah Smith a long time ago, and then I, when I was poking around looking for sources about uh, this, someone said to me, oh, you should read Sarah Smith's dissertation. I was like, oh, 
I even know Sarah Smith. That's cool. So Sarah Smith uh, wrote a doctoral dissertation called Shul with the School, a History of the Development of Non-Orthodox Day Schools in Los Angeles. As some of you may know, um, the LA community is uh, pretty distinctive among American communities in that there are many K to eight or one to eight day schools associated with synagogues or temples, not as standalone schools, but synagogue or temple schools, including in many non-Orthodox temples. Okay, so it's not at all in, in Los Angeles, private Jewish schooling is both associated with houses of worship and it is not exclusively an Orthodox phenomenon. And Sarah Smith and her doctorate, which she completed in 2017, says, I don't know how to break it to you people, but you know when we start to get an enormous flowering of synagogue-based, temple-based, religious Jewish schools, again, in under uh, whatever denominational rubric, we get that when integration comes to the LA Unified School District in the form of busing. When LA says it's not enough to say we're removing the requirement of segregation, I actually don't think that LA schools were ever segregated by law, but they're segregated in fact because of housing segregation. And so in order to ensure meaningfully integrated schools, we are going to bus kids from these neighborhoods to those neighborhoods and from those neighborhoods to these neighborhoods. Um, busing uh, was approved by the Supreme Court in the late 1960s. Busing when it happened was both very unpopular with many parents and actually successful in integrating schools. Um, there has been an enormous retrenchment both on the court and in communities away from busing and there has been a significant resegregation of American public schools over the last uh, couple of decades. Okay, but when you get cross district busing coming to um, Los Angeles after the 1969 Supreme Court decision that allows busing, you are then going to have um, really meaningful integration of the LA schools. So if LA followed the Atlanta model, what would we expect LA parents to do in order to um, LA white parents who don't want to send their kids to integrated schools, even if they cluck cluck about Mississippi or Alabama, right? There's that very special species of um, uh, uh, northern, midwestern, or western white person who is very, very critical of Mississippi and Alabama, but please do not integrate my child's schools. Nicole Hannah Jones, um, who is a brilliant journalist for the New York Times, uh, MacArthur Prize winner, has written a great deal about uh, integration and schools and the extent to which New York City parents, New York City white urban professional class liberal parents are working very hard to keep their kids' public schools from being integrated. Um, but that's a, a yet another topic and not our topic tonight. So LA's gonna integrate the public schools and if the Atlanta model was followed, what would we expect people to do? I'm gonna assume you, called, you raised your hands and I called on you. What we would expect people to do is to leave, right? They would move out of the same way they did in Atlanta, move out of the city into the first ring of suburbs, right? You could do what Richard Rothstein said, which is basically segregate the suburbs. And then you can just have your small community-based school and it'll be an all white school. And you have avoided integration without ever saying the nasty words whites only, which would trigger some very hostile review by the Supreme Court and that would all be fine. But in LA, that's not going to work. And it's not going to work because of something that passed in California in the 1970s called Prop 13. And what Proposition 13 was, uh, was the product of a tax revolt in California by Californians against rising property taxes in California. That California tax revolt is part of, it's hard to, it's hard, I tell my students all the time, you have to remember that the, <laughs> there's a line from a biography of Louis Pasteur. Now, why was I reading biographies of Louis Pasteur? Because I was once in graduate school in history of science. So there's a line in the biography of Louis Pasteur that was published in the early 1900s that homonyms are not synonyms 30 years apart. And I quote that to my students all the time. Things that sound the same don't mean the same thing 30 years apart. So when I say California to you today, what that means to you is like bluest of the blue states, right? Crazy liberal democratic, whatever. That's not what California was in the 1970s and the 1980s. California was actually the seat of a new kind of suburban conservatism that among other things gave us Ronald Reagan, right? That was California. Um, Orange County, California, um, which, which was a Republican stronghold for a very long time. Um, and so it was that California that rose up in revolt against property taxes and passed Proposition 13, which capped property taxes at the level they had been at when Prop 13 passed and only allowed very small rates of increase on property taxes unless the home changed hands. If you sold 
your home, bought a new home, then that new home would be assessed at whatever its current market value was for taxing purposes. If you didn't follow that, if you follow that, that's great. If you didn't follow all that, the point is that people would take a tremendous tax hit if they moved. Their property taxes would skyrocket if they moved when they were capped if they stayed in place. And so you have people who live in Los Angeles proper, Dr. Smith says, who are not going to move out of Los Angeles because to move out of Los Angeles means to, into some suburb, it means to take an enormous financial hit. They're going to stay in LA and yet they're still trying to keep their kids out of integrated schools. And, um, and what do they do? They start day schools affiliated with their temples, affiliated with their synagogues as a way to have a school system to which they can send their children while living in Los Angeles that are not going to be meaningfully integrated. So why is this a lot to sit with? It's a lot to sit with for me because I'm a day school educator. That is what I do. I've sent all of my children to day schools because I deeply believe in the day school model as the model that is going to give our kids the knowledge and the skills that they need to be meaningfully engaged, informed, practicing Jews. And yet I see that while, and I am not negating, I want to be very clear. The thing about stories is that it's not an either or. There's not one story or another story, and it's either sto this story or that story. As you can hear, one of the wonders of teaching on Zoom is that my eight-year-old son um, is feeling challenged by the need to maintain silence while I teach. I will make all of you who have ever struggled uh, your way through a meeting with somebody in the background uh, feel good that that's how it looks on this side of the headset also. So let's go back to where I was up to. I believe in day school education. I think day school education is of enormous value. I work in a day school. I've committed my life to day schooling. I send my children to day school because I think it's a value to them. I don't think there's only one story. Oh, if day school education has some roots in racism, in attempting to maintain segregated school systems when you couldn't just say anymore, this is a segregated school, that doesn't mean that it doesn't also have roots in parents sacrificing enormously and paying very high costs to ensure that their children had meaningful religious education. The thing about narratives is that we don't have a choice of one or the other. There can be multiple things and multiple layers operating at the same time. But for me, when I start to think about day school education and about what it means that we have a system, let's park intent for a second. Even if the intent of the people who started day schools was to avoid meaningful integration 50 or whatever the right number of it is, 55, 60 years ago, let's, uh, let's, let's be most generous in our ascription of motives and say that's not why parents are choosing this today. I, don't, I have no need to attribute or to impute terrible motives to people. Let's say that I assume the best possible motives for everybody. And I assume that everybody is doing this right now out of their deep concern for their children's Jewish educations. Nevertheless, I have to face squarely what the impact is, right? This is a really important lesson that we have about thinking about race and racism and other forms of discrimination. The, we're not centering the person who's doing the discriminating, well, what they mean by it, what they intend, what was their intention, because don't call me racist, right? That's not the question. The question is what's the impact of what you're doing? And if the impact of what you're doing is to create a segregated school system and to educate our kids in a functionally segregated school system, those are very ugly words, right? We are educating our kids in a functionally segregated school system, then that's something that we really, really need to think about. Um, and if we say in a really difficult thing to face squarely, but for other reasons, we are going to keep sending our kids to these schools, then we have to ask ourselves, what responsibility are we taking for that? How do we plan to ameliorate or mitigate or address or even just face and acknowledge that reality alongside the story that we love to tell, which is a story of us as a community sacrificing enormously for our kids' religious education. And I want to say that while I have particularly focused on and been interested in the case of Jewish day schools and of religious schools, because uh, that's where I work, that's where I teach, that's where I send my kids, and that's um, this, this particular case where I think we 
we can launder um, some very problematic motivations through the no-no bridge concerned about our kids' uh, religious education. Again, I will repeat to you, New York City has a highly segregated public school system. Uh, Nicole Hannah Jones has documented in the New York Times the fights and the pushback from parents when there were attempts to redraw uh, district lines for elementary schools to include um, more children of color, more underprivileged children in what had been wealthier, whiter school districts. And the amount of pushback they got from parents who, of course, would insist at community meetings that they were not racist, but it would work better if those kids weren't in our kids' schools. And of course, New York City also has an enormous uh, private school network. So parents who want to opt their kids out of the public school system entirely can and do. And there are enormous ra uh, race and class implications in who is out. So this is not solely the question of, of uh, religious schools, of day schools. While an example of this, while one particularly pointed example of this, is not the only case where I might say, well, I chose to put my kid in a private school because that's an outstanding school that will afford them great opportunities. They'll get a fantastic education and wonderful values, and it's all good. I still have to ask myself, what's the impact of that? What am I doing? The fights we've witnessed recently over the, um, uh, the selective private high, uh, no, public high schools in New York City, the selective public high schools in New York City, for which there is a test to get in. And, um, and the reality that right now, a, a minuscule percentage of the students in those schools are African-American. Despite the overwhelming uh, majority of students in New York City public schools being black and Hispanic, a tiny percentage of kids in those selective public schools are black and Hispanic. And yet when the idea was floated of getting rid of uh, tests for admission, again, there was enormous pushback. And so here we are left with really challenging and uncomfortable questions to ask. I want to put a lot of them out there. Then I want to read a little bit about whether Jews are white or not, or how we think about Jews and whiteness. And which Jews are we talking about when we ask if they're white anyway, because some Jews are pretty clearly not white. And, you know, who do you mean by when you say Jew? Um, but first, I just want to mention or, or lay out, not mention, but I want to lay out some of the questions that are on the table here. So question number one is, how do I weigh or think about the competing values when what I want for the benefit, the good, of, I think, of my own child, whether that's, again, my kid getting a better education in private school, or maybe more significantly, I think the good of my child's soul, religious future, however we'd like to put it, works against what I think makes a better and healthier society. Is there, I do, I, if you ask me what I think would be best for, and for healthiest for society, I think sending my children to public school would indubitably be the best and healthiest for society. I'm not doing it anyway. And that's, that's something that I have to figure out how to, uh, how to navigate and, and what to do about. Next question is, is there any meaningful way that we can address this within our school systems? And various schools are trying, some of New York City's private schools have tried to address race, class, and privilege square on in ways that are very complicated and loaded. I find that our, our yeshiva day schools in the Orthodox world are many steps behind addressing that. The school I work in is probably doing it more than many, most, maybe any other. And it's still um, uh, loaded and complicated for reasons that we'll get to. And what does that even mean to address it? It doesn't mean, you know, a once a year program in which we bring the kids from this school and the kids from that school together. That's not building the kind of connections, relationships, understandings that honestly are necessary for citizenship uh, to say nothing of getting to any kind of equity or justice. But let's even just talk about citizenship and shared understandings of the society in which we live. I don't think that my students have a great understanding of the truths of the society in which we live, but honestly, I'm not sure that if they went to the other local private schools, if they went to Horace Mann, if they went to Fieldston, if they went to, to uh, Riverdale Country, that they would have such a much more accurate picture of what American society looked like. Um, so, the, so again, an Orthodox day school might be a particular kind of bubble, but I think it's probably a difference of degree rather than kind from the other bubbles that many uh, similarly situated New York City kids are in. So that's a second question. A second question would be, can we uh, ameliorate? Another question is, is there any meaning in acknowledging this, even if we don't think that there's a way that we can solve it or address it or fix it or make it better? What are we, is, is there value in just knowing these stories and telling these stories? Is there value in sitting with this discomfort? Um, is there value in articulating to our kids this discomfort? Uh, sometimes students, when I try to talk about this with them, will say, are you just trying to make me feel guilty? I say, no, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty at all. 
feel guilty is the last thing that I think is, you know, just sort of sitting around marinating and feeling bad. Um, I'd like us to understand. And then if we feel uncomfortable, maybe we feel motivated to try to think about what to do. But again, think about what to do is very complicated. If I'm saying that I am committed for my own children to religious day school education. Um, and then with all of those questions, uh, the larger question that comes into play is the question of what racial category do even white passing Ashkenazi Jews fit into? I once was teaching for Hartman in, uh, in LA and I was talking about Jews and race and stuff and stuff. And uh, somebody basically said, Rivka, you're all full of it. They said, here in LA, we have a large population of Persian Jews, of Jews of Iranian background, and we get stopped every time. We, had, we get randomly selected to be searched every time we go through an airport. So don't sit here and talk to me about whiteness and Jews, because let me tell you about being a Jew of Iranian background. Um, this was obviously a few years ago, and you know, I guess a little closer to 9-11 and a little bit more well, I was going to say a little bit more Islamophobia, but I don't think that's, that's gone any place. Um, and they were being pulled aside uh, to be screened. Obviously, they're not Muslim, but they were understood to be Muslim and therefore being pulled apart to be screened um, every time they went through an airport. So uh, acknowledging, as I said in the beginning, uh, that Jews are not all Ashkenazi white passing, but in this conversation in which we talk about the Jews who are moving to the suburbs and establishing day schools in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, we are largely talking about um, those Jewish communities. Uh, I think it's then worth actually facing square on the question of Jews and whiteness. Um, the first time I had a conversation like this with a group of my alumni, we, we bring our graduates from SAR High School who wanna come back, the ones who are in college come back in May for a week of learning once they're done with their college year, but we're still in school. And we spoke with them, it was in the past couple of years because it was post the 2016 election, the theme of learning for that week was Jews and citizenship. And I was talking to them about something about race and was really a little taken aback to hear how many of my students said to me, we don't consider ourselves white. And they were not Jews of color to be clear. They were white passing Ashkenazi Jews. We don't consider ourselves white. I said, what does that mean you don't consider yourselves white? You know, white is the dominant group, white is the people in power, white is the, that's not us, we're Jews. And at the time, this is just a few years ago, it actually seemed to me like an abdication, like a dodge. You're not acknowledging how much power you in fact have, how much you've been able to accomplish and how much success your parents and your grandparents were able to get to because they came to this country and through no fault of their own, they got coded as white, boom. And that gave them access and opportunity in a way that if they come to this country and is black, boom, they would not have had. Um, so at the time, it seemed to me like a dodge. Just a few years later, with the uh, enormously increased concern about and conversation about anti-Semitism and a, a feeling of precariousness on the part of many of us that I have to say, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, back when Brooklyn was not cool. Um, when I say Brooklyn, you think that means something cool. It doesn't. That was when only nerds lived in Brooklyn and all the cool people lived in Manhattan. Uh, but I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. I've lived in New York City my entire life, except the year I spent in Israel and a few years I spent in college in Cleveland. Um, I never, I lived in New York City through the worst of the crime wave. I was a kid in New York City in the 80s and 90s. My mother was not the same mother who said the worst thing they could do is say no. I took the subway by myself when I was in middle school. Um, I was not, I, I did not grow up scared in New York. I grew up very comfortable in a city where there were then 2,000 and whatever murders a year. Um, I didn't feel precarious or frightened or threatened in America until I turned on my radio on Saturday night uh, in August of 2017 after Charlottesville and heard um, people chanting, Jews will not replace us. And I, I was like, what, what nightmare did I just wake up in? And then I turned off the radio so my kids wouldn't hear it because I didn't want to scare them. There are plenty of Jews who would say to me, you are ridiculously naive. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Why did you think that this country in this you know, moment in time was going to be different? That's always our story. The answer is, well, I did. That might be because I come from a very American family with no Holocaust history. It might be because um, I was raised to be, and with all of my awareness of the ways that American history doesn't make our, us feel warm and fuzzy in our tummy, I consider myself to be a deeply patriotic American. Um, I feel, I have felt in many ways the, the gifts of what I have had in this country, even as I've come to an ever greater awareness of the people who haven't been given those gifts. And then came August of 2017, and it was just like, what on earth? Um, and so 
then saying I don't feel white seemed like less of a dodge and more like a, an acknowledgement. And then I started to read all these things about, you know, contingent whiteness and revocable whiteness. And then somebody memorably wrote an article about Jews being off white, right? Kind of there, but not exactly. Um, and that I think is something else that's important for us in this, in this uh, stew of complicated and challenging questions that we're facing and willing to be challenged by. I think it's also worth saying, and we can turn it yet again and say, it's not only about Jews, um, again, white passing Ashkenazi Jews as white people occupying positions of power. It's also worth saying, what about this combination of power and precarity? What about this combination of, in many ways, we have been very successful and accomplished a great deal, and yet in other ways, we have and can continue to feel ourselves threatened, threatened physically, threatened in other ways, unsafe. Um, the last time I taught for Hartman on Zoom, which was a couple of weeks ago and was less interrupted by my eight-year-old son, we were Zoom bombed um, because you didn't have to do what you had to do tonight. It was just a free Zoom link because Hartman was starting Hartman at home and thought that was safe. So we did Hartman at home and we were Zoom bombed by some low-rent Nazis who showed up in our Zoom and started writing unpleasant things in the chat and the um, moderators threw them out and that was that. And so tonight you had to get some kind of confirmation and thing emailed to you and link and whatever it was because no more putting open links out into space because that's what it means to be Jewish organizations doing Jewish programming um, in 2020 apparently. Who knew? Uh, so let's look at Emma Green in the Atlantic for a couple of minutes. Are Jews white? And every one of these is a reference obviously to a longer piece of reading that you are uh, welcome to go back to. Um, on the extreme right, Jews are seen as impure, a faux white race that has tainted America. In fact, we're, we're the worst kind of fake white because we, we pass as white and so we can smuggle in other people of color, right? That, that uh, claim that that's what Jews were doing was what motivated um, the shooter at the temple in Pittsburgh. Uh, and on the extreme left, Jews are seen as part of white majority establishment that seeks to dominate people of color. Taken together, these attacks raise an interesting question, are Jews white? Again, I have to just say that Emma Green is clearly making some assumptions here about who Jews are. There are obviously some Jews who are clearly not white, so I think it's important to say that. Uh, over time, Jews have become more integrated into American society, a process scholars sometimes refer to as becoming white. Becoming white obviously doesn't mean your skin color changes, it means it's how you are seen uh, by the society um, changes, right? The fact that people can become white and unbecome white shows us that race is a social construct. It is defined by society. Students sometimes think that I mean when I say race is a social construct that I mean we made up what color your skin is. Now, I, I don't mean we made up your color, what color your skin is. Your skin is some color. I mean we made up what significance we attribute to that. So that in the early 20th century, Jews were a separate race in American life. Jews were not considered to be white. And then somebody came along and decided that Jews would be white. Various other groups have gone through this kind of a racial transformation where they weren't white and then they become white. Um, right in the late 19th century, there were absolutely, I mean, late 19th century and early 20th century, there were, there were all kinds of public accommodations in the United States that barred Jews, hotels and whatever it was that barred Jews from entering. Uh, private clubs have barred Jews for much longer than that. Uh, when my father went to, when my father started college, colleges in the United States still had quotas on the number of Jews they would accept. Um, so here's a weird crossover story between my doctoral dissertation research and this. So uh, the first atomic bomb was dropped on August 6th, 1945. The second atomic bomb was dropped on August 9th, 1945. And in the interest of understanding how the atomic bomb was reported on and discussed in American popular media, I was sitting there reading Time magazines from the fall of 1945, as one does. And I come across a Time magazine article in the fall, from the fall of 1945 with an interview from the president of Dartmouth. As you may or may not know, Dartmouth historically let in many fewer Jews than others of the Ivies. And as Rothstein says about the racism of the federal government leaving its mark on suburbs until today, that leaves its mark on the, the differential Jewish population of different Ivy League universities until today, to some extent, um, uh, was shaped by the extent to which those universities were accepting of Jews in the middle of the 20th century. So Dartmouth had a very strict quota. It would not take more than 5% of any incoming class. Uh, you know, only 5% could be Jewish. The president of Dartmouth was interviewed in Time Magazine about this quota. And the president of Dartmouth in 1945 gave an interview to Time Magazine explaining why this was not only a perfectly great thing to do, but actually was good for the Jews. 
And the reason it was good for the juice, I promise you, he said this in an interview in Time Magazine. You can go find it. The reason it's good for the juice, he said, is because if the men of Dartmouth were around too many Jews, they would obviously come to dislike them because you know how they are. So by limiting the number of Jews who could come to Dartmouth in any given year, he was actually ensuring that the men of Dartmouth did not become anti-Semites. That this could be said by president of the university and published in a major national news magazine in 1945 and still be thought of as like, you know, something one could say out loud in public shows you the extent to which uh, American Jews, even those of us with the white passing Ashkenazi variety, once were a lot less white than we are now and have become a lot more white. Okay. Uh, over time, Jews assimilated. And like other white people, they fled to the suburbs. And we talked about this. They took advantage of the opportunities. I'm going to say they were racially limited to the white people, like moving to the suburbs and the GI Bill, which is also racially limited to white people. We're not going to talk about that right now. Um, they became middle class. They thought they were becoming white. Okay. And yet, and yet, and yet, and yet. Uh, so even Goldstein, who studies Judaism and anti-Semitism for a living, says he finds it hard to believe that Jews are in any real danger of losing their status in American society. We are integrated into all the institutions. We dis disproportionately represented in all kinds of ways. We know that. And yet, no matter how much prestige Jews may amass, their status is always ambiguous. So I'm not interested in talking about this for the purpose of talking about Jews and whiteness. I am interested in talking about this for the purpose of analytically, how do we think about these questions that implicate race? If we're conditionally white, provisionally white, off-white, sort of, kind of, but not always, how do we think about then navigating the questions about what we've done? Um, and for me, I don't, uh, I don't actually feel incredibly challenged by that. I think it's possible for me to say that there are many places where I have been able to inherit the um, privileges of whiteness. Um, and I have to acknowledge that and reckon with that in an American context and also places where I feel much more precarious. And this is the particular strangeness uh, of the Jewish condition, of the Jewish condition in the United States in this moment, the American Jewish condition in the United States in this moment, that we are in many ways at our, our, our peak um, of success in, in many ways and yet uh, feeling uh, increased precarity, certainly more than we have in the past generation. But that too, I think, is something that we need um, to think about and consider as we wrestle with these important questions. So let's do a little bit of summation and then we will open for questions and you can put uh, questions in the chat box. A little bit of summation is that as we think about American Jews and race, I wanna look at one particular question, which is schooling. And schooling hits at some of our very dearly held narratives about how we as a community value education. Uh, again, I, I look at in particular religious education, but it is certainly broader than just religious education, how we value education, how we sacrifice for our children's education, how we care about and invest in our children's education. When we look at the history of the educational structures that our kids are part of and benefit from, and, and included in those educational structures, again, I wanna say are, if we live in suburbs where we then benefit from excellent public schools in those suburbs, we have to ask what created those suburban structures that gave us those excellent public schools. When we look at the history, when a, when a parent says, I'm moving to the suburbs for the schools, Again, I'm not talking about their intent at all. The impact is I am moving to a neighborhood that carries a legacy of segregation and may remain largely segregated because I see the schools in that neighborhood as being better educational opportunities for my child. Wow, that's, that's once you say those sentences out, that's a, quite a lot to say. Okay, so schooling, the, the very thing that we as a community have invested so much in and feel so much pride about is also a place where there is a very, very complicated um, and challenging, painful, ugly, hard uh, racial history for white passing Ashkenazi Jews to reckon with. And to some extent, um, we can dodge that by saying that might have been the intent of the people in the 1960s, but that's certainly not our intent now. That might or might not be fully true. But even if we satisfy ourselves with that, I think we still have to ask what the impact of our choices is. And we have to push hardest on, and if we are committed to these choices, for religious schooling and for religious education because that's a value, but we acknowledge that this is an outcome of this as well, then what? What kind of responsibility do we take for that? What are we doing about that? How are we thinking about, teaching about, talking about that? What, if anything, can be done to ameliorate that? Um, and maybe I will end right here close to where I started and then we can open up for questions, which is um, I am proud that at some point we as a school community were asked to send kids to Albany to, to be part of some broader day school effort 
to lobby the government in Albany for more money for our private schools. And I am proud that I had many students who said to me, I don't want to do that. I had many students who said to me, I understand that getting this kind of education is an enormous privilege and gift, but to lobby the government to send us money that otherwise would be educating kids in public schools actually doesn't seem to me to be the right thing to do. I'm not telling you that their parents who were paying day school tuition appreciated that principled stance. I'm, I will not promise you that. Uh, but I was actually um, impressed to hear that my students were capable of that level of thinking and awareness and understanding and ability to step back from their own lives and have some sense of what the broader context of uh, American life looked like and into which their school experience was slotting. Um, so that's about Jews and education and race um, and some of the really complicated and challenging questions it raises to the narratives we love to hold dear about ourselves and what some other much more challenging narratives can look like. And nobody has any questions at all. No, there there are quite a few questions. Uh, I was just trying to unmute myself. And, and first, oh, okay. I just want to say a uh, huge thanks to you uh, for that incredible presentation. Uh, there's It's so rich. There's so much in what you shared and the source material. And I think you, uh, at least, you know, I'll speak for myself, have articulated um, some of the things that I think many of us who either because we send our children or we went to private Jewish day school or private school, uh, sometimes feel in our, in our hearts and our souls and don't really want to say out loud. Uh, and yet it's so important to say these things out loud and to tell these complicated stories where multiple truths live together. Um, and I'm greatly appreciative for uh, your articulation of all of that. Um, as challenging as it as it is to to hear and to sit with, um, there are a number of questions sort of about the history. But one, uh, I just want to start with one relating to uh, some of the words that you use, the vocabulary that you used around power and privilege. Um, and so, how do you, in in your uh, in your work, in your view, how do you define and differentiate power versus privilege? So I will tell you um, that to the extent that I said that, uh, that, that's something of a slip up and I'll tell you why. I have moved, I have tried to move away from using the word privilege. And the reason I've tried to move away from using the word privilege is not that I don't find it useful as a word, I find it very useful. I just find that there are some people uh, for whom it evokes a very, very strong negative response in a way that gets in the way of, of my saying, um, anything meaningful. A whole other conversation, and I address here the person who chatted me privately to ask uh, to what extent are day schools beginning to tackle this issue. I am, I am and have been trying to teach about this, not only in my day school, but to parents in my school, to the broad Orthodox community, and a great deal of that work has been figuring out how to tell this in a way that it can be heard, how to present this in a way that people can be receptive to this, rather than just hearing, so you're telling us at the day school that I'm sacrificing so much to send my kids to is a fundamentally racist endeavor and I should feel bad about it. Or, you know, or you're telling us, oh, then we're all racist, which obviously gets in the way of understanding and being open to hearing this. And I find the word privilege um, evokes very strong responses. Having said that, the reason why I find it useful, um, I, I, uh, I think I have a pretty old definition of privilege and that's from, um, I'm getting old, I forgot her name. You'll all remember her name that article about white privilege unpacking the invisible backpack, which is very old by now. And I'm sure many thank people have, gosh. thank you. Plenty of people have written their critiques about it, but what's so useful to my students is I, I talk to them about the things you don't have to think about. Most of my students are white passing. Most of my students are Ashkenazi. Almost all of my students are white passing. The things you don't have to think about. And when I say it that way, my kids get it. My kids, I mean my students. My, my, my kids get what I'm talking about when I talk about it. So I say, I am married to a man. I have never been in a setting in which I had to figure out if it was okay or safe to use a pronoun to refer to my spouse or if somebody was going to have some kind of reaction to me using a pronoun to talk about my spouse. It's always going to be okay if you're a woman to say he referring to your spouse. And if you're a woman and your spouse is a woman, you have to sort of figure out, is this a context in which 
that might be an example that's a little dated now. That might be a 10 years ago example, right? By now, it might feel like it's more safe in more context, but they get that. I don't have to worry about being pulled out of the line in the airport for a random screening. I'm not getting pulled out of the line in the airport for a random screen. I mean, I might be for a genuinely random screening, but not for those fake random screenings, right? I don't have to worry about all these kinds of things. And when I say that to my students, they can hear that. So when I say privilege, that's what I mean. I mean, the stuff you don't have to think about. Um, when I say power, I mean power. I mean, the way Eitan Hirsch described, uh, defines power as in politics as for power. I mean, the ability to get things done. Um, we as a community are very reluctant to talk about power because that's loaded for us in a lot of ways. But then we as a community, as a broader American Jewish community, also celebrate how many politicians show up to APAC to pay respects. Like, we expect them to show up there. Um, that's the broad we of the American Jewish community. You don't have to tell me if you expect them to show up at APAC or not. You understand what I mean. Um, that's a point of, of uh, pride for APAC, how many senators and representatives and presidential candidates, whatever it is, show up at APAC. Um, and I think we have to acknowledge uh, that there is power in, you know, in the most obvious ways of the, the ability to, to get stuff done. I'm not sure if that was totally what you wanted, but. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to pick up on uh, something you just alluded to is how do you address how you address this in your own school, to, speaking to parents and teaching uh, your students. And so there are a couple of questions related to that. Are day schools beginning to recognize and or address this issue? And then how do we take responsibility for this today? And if we decide to send our kids uh, how do we take responsibility for deciding to send our kids to day school knowing that we're part of perpetuating these systems? So what, what insight do you have on, on what's happening or how we can actually think about this if we do make the choice to send our children to day school or I would say to private school in general? So I'm going to say that honestly I have better answers to the first one than to the second one. Uh, to the first one, what's being done, I can't speak to the broad sweep of day schools. I know that in my own day school um, we are we try and certainly in the high school that I work in, we try hard to educate towards an awareness um, of the stories we don't know, of the stories we don't tell, of the stories we don't have access to. Um, I teach American history. I also taught this year a new course. Okay, so here's a funny thing. We offered a new course this year for the first time for seniors that was, that's going to have three different teachers team teaching the course. One's a history teacher, that's me, a politics teacher. One's an economics teacher, and one was a Judaics teacher. Who, who teaches uh, Talmud and Jewish philosophy. And the idea was that we were going to look at some challenging issues through all three lenses of politics, philosophy, and economics. So we called the course PPE. Now, of course, PPE means something totally different, and the whole country is talking about PPE. Now it means personal protective equipment for doctors, and all we're talking about are nurses, right, hospital workers, how they don't have enough PPE. But PPE was a course that I taught this year. Um, so one of the units that we taught in PPE was income inequality and wealth inequality in the United States, and really, like, pushing our students to face this and saying, where do you land on this uh, uh, spectrum of American life, and now what does the rest of the United States look like? Because I think it's important for my students to know that. Um, in addition to talking about, uh, oh, I mean, I, sorry. One more second about PPE. We spoke a different one of the units, not the unit of income inequality, it was about reparations and compensation for harm. And we were wily and sly and conniving. So we started with Holocaust reparations, and all of our kids are like, oh, yeah, I know, of course, there should be Holocaust reparations. Absolutely. And then we moved on from there to reparations for American slavery. And it's very hard after you've spent a few weeks, oh, of course, everyone's like, all right, yeah, Holocaust reparations. Now we're going to talk about American slavery. So that was a whole fascinating undertaking. And we got, this, this, is, this is the wonders of Zoom even before COVID-19. There's a reporter for the New York Times named Rachel Sworns who wrote the New York Times series of articles in which she broke the story that Georgetown University in the 1830s, um, the Jesuit priests who owned Georgetown had sold hundreds of people that they owned as slaves. They had sold them to make the money to keep Georgetown open when Georgetown was in danger of going broke in the 1830s. And this horrendous piece of Georgetown history was revealed. And then Georgetown gradually, slowly, haltingly uh, taking steps to do right by the descendants of those people who were sold um, under pressure at some point by Georgetown students and what was eventually done. And I reached out to Rachel Sworns and I said, would you speak to our class? And she did. And the moment of, of her talking about this experience of learning about and researching this African-American woman who's writing about this really painful and complicated and important episode in African-American history, but with relevance to our world today, to a class full of, you know, my Orthodox Jewish high school seniors was really a, a powerful moment. So we are trying to teach about that. That's, 
that's the long way of answering that. Um, I can't promise you that every school is, but I think there's much more awareness and much more moving in that direction. What do we do to actually mitigate or ameliorate? If I had an answer to that question, I would be doing it much better than I am. And uh, I was once at a, a convening of day school educators talking about this with them. And I was talking about trying to find a way to really meaningfully create contact between our, our kids are living in New York City. They're going to school in New York City. My kids go to school in the Bronx. The Bronx is the poorest urban county in the United States. Okay, my kids go to school in Riverdale. It's like a whole different part of the Bronx. The Bronx is the poorest urban county in the United States. It's not hard. I don't mean go do chesed at a soup kitchen. I mean find meaningful ways to get to know some people who live so close to you and whose life experiences are so different from you and to interact with them and to work with them on something over the course of a year and to really, I got significant pushback from other educators in, in a direction that I never would have predicted, but maybe, you know, I'm dumb. They said parents send their kids to day school so their kids will meet other Jews, hang out with other Jews, socialize with other Jews and marry Jews. They do not want you creating meaningful opportunities for their kids to have sustained ongoing, close, significant relationships with peers their age who aren't Jewish. I said, huh, never thought of that. That's a pretty big um, roadblock. And again, I, I want to be very clear. I am I'm a, a committed Orthodox Jew. I do not disagree with the value of having our Jewish kids marry other Jews. That's not the point. But that does smack, again, like I'm not disagreeing with the value of having our kids be learned and knowledgeable Jews. But if that requires pulling them out of the public school system and educating them privately and not having them interact with um, other New Yorkers or other Americans and stay within what my students sometimes call their bubble, then there are enormous trade-offs and costs to that. I don't know how to solve that yet. I would say I'm still working on it. I, a very small first step might be at least making people aware of what some of these challenges, issues, and problems are. So they don't just go to their almost all white school and then go home to their almost all white suburb and think this is all just the way things are and not ask the questions to try to deepen their understanding. To the person Thank who wrote in the, in the chat that they'll get to college campus and they're ill-prepared, um, I will say to you, as we say in, uh, I don't know, it's, it's Hebrew, but it feels more like Yiddish, halavai. I wish that would be the problem. I've spent quite a bit of time over the past couple of years visiting college campuses. I was actually supposed to go spend a Shabbat in, at Brandeis at the end of March, but obviously nobody's going anyplace by the end of March. Um, speaking to communities, to Jewish communities on campuses and visiting my students while I'm there. And not in all campuses, but in many, uh, my Orthodox Jewish students are going to campuses with very large Orthodox Jewish populations, and they are actually to some extent, at least managing to go to college and still sort of bring the bubble with them. Right. Thank you. Um, you you mentioned just now uh, some some of the explicit pushback that you got from educators um, about the desire to sort of stay in the bubble and parents' desires to stay in the bubble. And so there's a question kind of looking at the history um, about whether the, um, are there primary sources about the founding of day schools uh, that speak to kind of the, the conscious or implicit uh, choice to create day schools um, that would keep this bubble and keep that racial segregation. So for example, the words of school or community leaders, the mission statements of school, oral histories that tie to the issues of race that are presented. That is an outstanding question. And if I were starting to write a doctorate now, that actually is something I would be enormously interested in. Um, in the absence of having that, I, I'm not starting to write on the doctor now, just to be clear. Um, so I'm not doing that work myself. I, the school that I work in, SAR, is actually made up, the reason why I got that odd name is because it was made up a merger of three different um, uh, day schools in the Bronx, Salon, Akiva, and Riverdale, that merged in 1969. So 1969 is a very telling year. They're consolidating three day schools in the Bronx in 1969 and moving it to Riverdale. And that sets off all kinds of lights and sirens in my brain. I'd like to know what was going on in the Bronx in 1969. Uh, I worked for two years at the Frisch School in Paramus, New Jersey. Um, the Frisch School was founded in the early 1970s. It is now, I believe, the largest modern Orthodox high school in the United States. I think that's true. And Frisch was founded in the early 70s. Again, founding a school in the New Jersey, the northern New Jersey suburbs, the Bergen County suburbs of New York City in the early 1970s, 
there's got to be a history there and I would love to know what it is. Um, in the absence of that, I'm not writing another doctorate now, instead what I do is the whole field of suburban history, just so you know this, and of schools and the suburbs and all this stuff is a very much a burgeoning and developing field. As you can tell from the fact that I'm quoting to you Cruz's book from the 20 whatever, you know, early 2000s, and then Rothstein's book from 2017 and Smith's dissertation from 2017. Um, it's an exploding field, and I am busy. I, I this sounds like it's a joke, but it's not a joke. I'm actually serious. I'm like stalking the people writing doctorates in this field. Like as soon as your uh, dissertation is out, how can I get a copy? Um, so somebody, there's a woman named Paige Glotzer who was at Harvard. Her, her book is just coming out, so I ordered it. And then there's somebody else who just posted on Twitter that he finished his dissertation again about this is on in New York City, uh, Nassau County. Sorry, not New York City. New York City is suburbs of on Long Island in Nassau County. But again, about funding mechanisms and schools and all kinds of stuff that I'm really interested in. So I messaged him and I said, when's it going to be a book? I need to get my hands on that. Um, I don't have anybody who's actually going directly to the day school sources. If somebody wants to write a doctorate in the history of Jewish education, this is a really good one to write. Uh, thanks. We, we have time for a couple more questions. There are some in the chat. I do see at least one person raising their hand. So I'm going to ask you if, to put your question in the chat and hopefully we'll get to all of them. Um, there are, I want to put two questions together that kind of ask uh, the different sides of, of a coin. One is, um, were Jews of the, the era that you were speaking of so eager to be seen as white that they pushed for private segregated schools so as to be accepted the way that other white uh, non-Jews were doing? Um, the other question is, were Jews actually, or are Jews trying to create a space to preserve a minority culture because that's their identity is as a minority? So what's your perspective on that? So I'm going to take the second question first and say, again, I think that's a really important question about the complicated and layered narratives here. This is not an either or. Either Jews are, you know, oppressed victims of anti-Semitism or we're white people using power and you got to pick a team and, and stick with it. Um, I think it's possible for us to be minorities and preserving our minority culture and also be able to pass as white and also be able to enter the halls of power and have to think about when we're doing what in a way that's reflective and thoughtful and acknowledges the complexity of that. And I'll layer on some more complexity. Um, those Jews who are visible minorities are minorities in a very different way than those Jews who aren't visible minorities. Um, and if we think about uh, if we think about ultra-Orthodox Jews or other Jews who are clearly visually identifiable as being Jewish, they may have a completely different experience of being Jewish in the world than Jews who you don't know that they're Jewish unless you know that they're Jewish. Um, and so I think it's important also to, to understand that the complexity cuts in many ways. But yes, obviously, um, the argument here is not that the only way to be... Um, The only, um, so, so uh, we can be cognizant of the need to maintain our own um, identity and culture and also aware of the ways in which we're not a minority group exactly the same way the other minority groups are. We are a minority group in ways in which, again, in some ways we have it worse and some ways we have it better and we don't have to play that game. We can recognize complexity, layers, narratives, and everything else. Um, sorry, first part of the question was, First part of the question was sort of the opposite. Uh, were, were Jews potentially um, trying to create these schools because they wanted to be seen as white? And this is what other white people were doing when they were moving to the suburbs. So the first thing that needs to be said, which I'm sure you've said in other sessions in this series, is that the completely, I won't say completely, the largely, um, Uh, I'll moderate myself a little bit more. We like to tell ourselves a story about Jews support for civil rights and then quote, you know, verses from the prophets that support justice and say, yeah, all the Jews were down with that. Uh, yeah, that's not how that went down. Um, Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail was addressed to the moderate clergy who were standing in the way of civil rights, some of whom were moderate ministers and some of whom were moderate rabbis. So yeah, that. Um, so it's certainly, the. the Jews were not in the forefront of fighting for civil rights. Having said that, I do not think that the Jews who moved to the suburbs of New York City or the suburbs of, um, you know, of 
of Atlanta or wherever else it was, were looking to construct whiteness by being segregated because that's what white people did. I just think they wanted to, I mean, frankly, I think they wanted to have white schools, not because they wanted to be um, accepted by other white people. Um, in order to do that, they changed their last names and did various, which, you know, they did plenty of. They changed their last names or did plenty of other things. Um, but I think the desire, those people who want to do that, of course, could send their kids to, to suburban um, pri uh, public schools or elite private schools, which by then were taking Jews, but certainly to the, to the good suburban public schools and the suburban communities they're moving to. I think the desire to have Jewish schools was both the desire to have Jewish schools and the desire to have uh, all white environments. But that I, I will say again, I have not done primary source research into um, the origins of uh, those day schools in the 60s and 70s. And so I don't want to get out over my skis in terms of saying things that I don't have the evidence for. Thank you. I think we're going to do two more questions that uh, have, you know, somewhat connected. Uh, one is uh, regarding, you know, your perspective on other models for Jewish education, such as the Talmud Torah model that used to exist uh, and doesn't really exist anymore, where, you know, kids would go to school, uh, you know, four or five days a week, religious school, after being in public education, or perhaps other models that haven't yet been invented. Are there, can you as a as someone who is committed to Jewish education clearly, personally and professionally, could you imagine other models uh, coming into being that would allow people to meet the needs of constructing that strong Jewish education and identity for their children while also participating in the public school system and being part of the larger diversity of the, of the cities and suburbs in which they live? So I'll say two things. One is this is the perfect time to be asking that question because obviously all of our educational models have been totally upended. And uh, if you are like me, you read um, what various uh, epidemiologists and public health experts are saying about the next year and 18 months and two years with your heart in your throats as they tell us we should not expect a magic wand putting everything back to normal in September. I'm like, please, please, please don't say that to me. Um, but that's what they're saying to us. And and so, so that really challenges, really challenges the extant models. Um, and I'll explain, and in case it's not totally obvious, I'll explain why in a minute, and may shake things up. The Talmud Torah model stopped because the Talmud Torah model didn't really succeed. And the Talmud Torah model didn't really succeed because it's very hard when your kids' friends all end school at 2.30 or 3 and go off to play on the sports team. And you're like, guess what, sweepy? We're now going for two hours of religious instruction with the rabbi. How much fun does that sound instead of playing on the sports teams? I, I, I'm not joking about this at all. The giant value proposition of day school education above public school plus two hours of Talmud Torah in the afternoon is that your kid could be on the sports teams and in the whatever, you know, the Model UN League and the everything else in a way that is Shabbat observant and he can participate in with his friends and it doesn't start until after school is over and he's not missing out all the time. The trade-off of you can have your religious education but always be missing out didn't work because it didn't work. The giant challenge, of course, is that if all of our kids are learning on Zoom, and nobody's playing in any sports leagues. What then? Especially when you couple that with the enormous financial hardship the community is facing and the cost. Uh, if my kid is sitting on Zoom for seven hours a day, does it have to be, does it have to be Zoom for seven hours or whatever number of hours a day your child is sitting on Zoom? Does it have to be Zoom for seven hours a day while I pay day school tuition or could it be five hours a day of free public school and two hours a day of Talmud Torah and again, I, I hope we're all going to be back in sports leagues soon, and we'll be back competing in Model UN, and we'll be back in drama and putting on school plays, and we won't be doing this from our living rooms forever. Um, but I think the potential for this to shake things up is enormous. But the Tom, the Talmud Torah model makes sense on makes vast sense on paper, right? We then our kids could be citizens, and we could pay less to it, and and. But for the kids' lived experience of it, it just it didn't work. So the related question is, you know, as a religious person, how do you think about this work religiously? Is there, is, do you feel a sense of, of mitzvah, of religious obligation in finding a way to address these issues in your personal life and as a professional? Asking if I, if I have a, can, can you, sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, so I'll, I'll read it as, as it was put in the, mm -hmm. in the chat. Um, aside from your role as a historian and teacher, 
what do you see as the mitzvah of this work? What is the religious obligation? So I, I, right, so I just want to clarify, you mean the mitzvah of this, not, not the work of uh, Jewish education, but this right. work. The work of addressing yeah. issues around racial disparity and, and how race is, you know, how it plays into Jewish education. So I actually, I'm, I'm a little leery of the word mitzvah here, and I'll tell you why. I try to be very careful to avoid what I call Torah washing, which is taking my strong personal beliefs or preferences and acting as though they are mandated by the Torah or by God. I do not think that being a good American citizen is mandated by the Torah or by God. I know you can quote Jeremiah saying, seek out the well-being of the city to which I've exiled you. Yeah, okay. I don't really think that's talking about being a good American citizen. Um, I think it's important for us to be good American citizens as an American obligation, if that makes sense. I'm not sure I'm gonna argue that it's a Jewish obligation. We are here, we are enormously the beneficiaries of the, um, of the beauty and the rights and the privileges of the American system. Again, acknowledging that not everybody is able to be beneficiaries in the same way. I think that we have a deep moral obligation to make this country better, to help it live out the true meaning of its creed, which it has done a crummy job on, but I have not given up on that creed or the sense that our job is to uh, help make a more perfect union. Um, but I, I, I think that deeply as, think of that deeply as an obligation and would be leery of framing it as a mitzvah. Mm -hmm. And I tell my students all this because I think that modeling this is important. I tell my students I'm a total sap about voting. I bring my children with me. We all go to the polling place. We all get the I voted sticker. I get, <laughs> my kids are all here telling you that the stickers are the best part of going to vote. <laughs> I, um, I get sentimental every single time I go vote. Um, the, and I tell my students all of this, about well, what a giant mush and squish I am about American democracy. And I believe deeply that it is our obligation. Daniel Bayar in one of his books um, talks about the need to justify my love. He's talking there about actually his love for Orthodox Judaism, but to justify my love, which he says he means both to explain it and to make it more just. I have to take this institution that I love and make it more just. Um, so I have an obligation to justify my love, which means to take this thing and make it, I know all the ways that you don't have to tell me I'm an American history teacher. I know all the ways it's not just. I feel a deep obligation to make it more just, but I don't feel that obligation as a, I, I don't attribute that obligation to being a mitzvah or to being God. I'm an, I don't ha, I, I almost feel like I don't have to. Well, that's the only way it's an obligation. If I, if I can find a proof text in the Torah, it's an obligation because I'm an American and I'm a whatever generation American. My grandmother was born here. We go back a ways. Um, and we have all been the beneficiaries of what this country has to offer, and that obligates me, including obligating me to recognize those groups and those individuals who have much less been able to be the beneficiaries of what this country has to offer. And to say the fact that I could obligates me to, sh to figure out how that wealth can be shared, not to hoard it, not to hold on to it and pull the ladder up after me, but to figure out how other people can, can enjoy um, the benefits of American citizenship, the way I have, I have been blessed to, my family has been blessed to, my children have been blessed to. I'm not sure I think of it as a mitzvah. Thank you. I, I think that's a, a great place to end. Um, and I, I think that, you know, as we, one of the other ways that we've talked about uh, stories in this work and as part of this Race in Us uh, initiative is what are the, our own personal stories that motivate us to think about what we think about, to be open to be ch being challenged by the types of uh, scholarship and presentation that you've offered us uh, to care about things. And some of us bring a story uh, like yours of American, a commitment to American democracy. Some of us bring a story of understanding it through a Jewish lens or as religious obligation. Um, and I, I wanna just note that the ways in which our own stories influence our desire and willingness to learn more, to change in our own thinking, in our own uh, behaviors, in, in ways that, that, that do negatively impact others, um, that's an important component of this as well. And so I hold out that, that challenge to each of us to think about what's the story that brought you here tonight to learn more about this um, and to want to perhaps do something about it. Um, we've used a lot uh, the, the Brian Stevenson framework uh, when he came to speak at BJ about a year and a half ago. His framework for uh, thinking about social change, one of those pieces 
Uh, he writes about it, of course, in the context of uh, mass incarceration and prison reform, uh, but, but I think is applicable when we're thinking about how do we create change, is, create, is changing the narrative uh, is one of his four uh, essential uh, components. And I think you've really helped us tonight to change narratives um, and complicate narratives in ways that uh, I hope will be productive for those of us who are living it right now in, in where, in, when we have, if we have children, where we're sending our children or how we're advocating for certain types of education to happen in our children's schools uh, or how we're thinking about you know, who we vote for and, and the question of vouchers and uh, those issues that are more in the public policy space. Perhaps this has challenged us to think uh, differently um, about some of those issues as well. So I want to say a, a huge thank you to you uh, and thank you to everyone for being here tonight. Um, thank you to uh, the Race and Us Steering Committee members who have helped put all of our programming together for, for this year. Um, I just put my email in the chat box. If you did not register for tonight and you would like to get um, and you would like to get the source sheets or uh, have any follow-up questions, please email me so that I know that you were here because uh, you're not on my registration list. Um, and, uh, and then we'll be very happy to get the information out to you. We're gonna be sending out a brief survey uh, later tonight or tomorrow um, with some questions about how you might wanna follow up on the learning that we were uh, so privileged to receive this evening. Um, are there small group conversations you want to have? How do you want to dig in further? Uh, so please take, you know, five minutes to respond to that survey when you see it in your in your inbox. Um, and I want to wish everyone a, a very sweet, healthy, uh, safe evening and rest of this period. Um, and again, thank you to you, Rivka. Uh, we really appreciate your uh, expertise and insight into these very challenging questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here, everybody.